Yeah. So I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to introduce a um, recent uh, alumni of UTD, uh, Alex Garcia Tepete. Alex works in the film industry. He has been and is currently a writer, a director, a producer, an editor. Um, I've probably forgotten a few of the other roles that you have played. You have both written and directed a film, um, and you've done a number of other film projects in the works. Um, he's here to come to talk informally about his life in filmmaking, about the path that he took at UTD that led him to make a decision that a career in film was a possibility, um, and to informally take, uh, take questions. Alex, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Dr. Dow. Um, and you know, one other thing that you forgot is that I'm an associate programmer for the Dallas Film Society. Yeah. So anything that is not in English, I get to pick for the film festival that we have every April. And I've been a part of that since I arrived here in uh, 2007. And we're about to go for our, what is it, eighth film festival? And I've been part of seven of them. I'm the third most senior person in the staff, uh, aside from the director and the head programmer, James and Sarah, respectively. Uh, but yeah, that, that was my way into the film industry here in Dallas that seven years ago it was booming and now it's about to, we're, we're fighting Austin on who gets to do more films here and television. Uh, the question that supposedly is part of the format is how did I pick my route? And basically, my first choice regarding that was coming here to Dallas, and specifically to UTD. I'm originally from Mexico, and I had graduated from high school. I had known since I was 12 that I wanted to uh, be a filmmaker. But filmmaking as a career, you don't really study in Mexico at the undergraduate level. You usually study communications or something akin to that, and then you go do a master's if you're lucky uh, to go into one of the, then there were only two grad, uh, grad film schools in Mexico, specifically in Mexico City, and they would only take about 20 students each every year. Uh, so it was very close, very shut in, very, if you're not already inside, you wouldn't get in. And I knew that it was like that also because I was kind of in because of my parents who used to be producers for television and commercials in the 80s. Uh, so, uh, I graduated from high school, I took a year off knowing that I wanted to be a filmmaker and that I needed to go abroad. I was uh, putting my sights on Europe, I had everything lined up, and then uh, kind of fate uh, played in and I got wind of UT Dallas, UT Dallas got wind of me, specifically the McDermott program. Uh, I went through the process and I came to visit Dallas and that was it. That's when I fell in love with the city, the people, and the opportunity that I like to build things. And coming here, I would have the opportunity to start UTD TV, which happened, uh, do a student film festival within the university that was already in existence but could use a little push. And just, um, I knew that Dallas was a good place for the arts and everything because it was booming. It was not established, it was not a program. You know, like in Los Angeles, you go into one of the established programs and either you check the boxes or you get kicked out. And here it was more of a free form. Um, and that's, that's my favorite part of the entire endeavor. Um, so I came here and my first thing that I did was to try to get a foot in the door and the Dallas Film Society back then, it was the AFI Dallas, so American Film Institute. Um, I applied for an internship, and we just clicked. And by we, I mean James, the director, then he was the head programmer, now he's the artistic director, and Sarah Harris, the uh, head programmer. Um, they took me in, and I became I started as an intern, but ever from the beginning, I was treated like I was staff, and now I'm staff. Um, and that allowed me to meet a lot of local filmmakers, filmmakers from Latin America, from Spain, from Europe, uh, play host a little bit, get in contact with distributors, learn more of the business, because if there's one thing that is true about filmmaking is that, yes, it's an art when you're doing it, 
but in order to get there, you need to learn it as a business because you need to learn how to get the investment to make movies, you need to know how to hire. Basically, each each time you make a movie, it's, a, it's like setting up a startup. Um, but then you need to figure out where to sell, how to sell it, how to push it, promote it, uh, in order to make the money back, or you don't get to make another movie. Um, and that's basically how I ended up here. Um, when I graduated, I had the the option of, well, moving back to Mexico and trying to break into the industry there that I knew some of my friends had tried and were having troubles accomplishing the same rate of success that they had accomplished in Canada or Spain. Uh, right. I could also go to uh, Los Angeles and try out among the plethora of others who are just trying to make it. Uh, or I could stay here and use all of my contacts and set up a production company, basically with the same scheme as you need to be, to the point where uh, Jacob Werser, my friend and partner setting up Utility to be, is now my business partner in uh, uh, nowadays Orange Productions, uh, our production company. And, and it just fell into play that, okay, let's stay here, let's make a movie, let's use everything that, let's be king of the hill here, rather than just one of the pack somewhere else. And it has worked. Um, and as the industry has grown, I have made more connections. I have, I have uh, currently one web series, two television series, um, one movie that I co-wrote with a friend that I met from SMU that we met through the film festival that same year that we both started, uh, Dan Carrillo. Um, he will be directing, I wrote the movie, and we got funded by the Canadian Film Institute and other production companies and will be shot uh, hopefully now in February. We keep pushing it, that's, that's how it goes. Uh, projects either happen within six months or they take their sweet time to brew and then uh, happen. Um, so yeah, I guess that's uh, some of it for now. So we can start with the passes and the conversation. So come on, throw, throw passes. I have a question for you. Uh, you spoke upon the Canadian and uh, Canadian, Spain and Mexican film industries. What strikes you as a difference between the open opportunities in Dallas, uh, Spain, and Canada versus Mexico? First is the approach to the entire uh, business. That here it's the show business, it's a film industry. In the other places, it's more about art and the shows. And uh, for example, Mexico right now is going into a transition phase. Uh, in the 80s, it was very commercial about filmmaking, uh, where they would just churn out what would be big house, grand house type of movies, and nothing worthwhile. Then funding and other, the way that you made a movie changed a lot in the 90s. So nobody wanted to make a movie except those that really wanted to make a movie. So there was this, then comes the generation of Cuaron, Alejandro González Iñárritu, everybody that came out of Mexico and are all highly regarded, Guillermo Aguilar, all of them happened in the 90s because of that. You couldn't make a movie unless it was good. And then it would go to film festivals and get recognition, and basically you would jump out of Mexico. Um, and that kind of caused a brain drain that would keep helping the film industry grow. Now they're going back into, oh, you can make movies, you can make comedies, commercial things that are also good, not just grand house level. Um, However, there's this big split uh, between the artful filmmaking that basically doesn't get doesn't make money, but it's all about sadness and bleak topics that everybody loves at can, and then <laughs> all the things that um, all the other movies that get the home market, romantic comedies, things that are very local and that basically don't get out of Mexico, but now they're making money. Um, so th that's uh, that's kind of like the process that Mexico is going on that is going on in Mexico right now, and it's similar to what has happened in uh, Spain, just that in Spain uh, it has been in a shorter time frame. So they went through the same thing with the change of regimes and all of that. Uh, now they're making they've been making really good television, really good movies for the past ten years. Um, to the point that now they're saturated. They have too much good stuff, uh, but at the same time, too much crap. Uh, because everybody can make, everybody can, 
the filter of quality that's happened because the resources were limited is gone, both in Mexico and in Spain. So a lot of people can go and make a movie with big stars, good production quality and everything, but then the story's not there or something is missing. Um, but again, instead of having 20 movies a year, now you have 100. And there's not a market uh, for those 100 movies, so it's 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 a bubble it's a bubble market uh, in in every single sense uh, for story and creativity, for the commercial side, for how it works, how many get made, um, and that's basically in all of Latin America. That's what's happening right now, thanks to technology boom. That you have a nice camera, you cannot shoot a you know, something that looks bad. That's that's just the bottom of the barrel. Uh, yeah, that's good job. Do you have a question or do you have, may I ask another? Please do. Okay, okay. Um, in terms of inspiration, you, you have studied the different markets in different countries. How did you, I mean, above all else, was Dallas your first, pers first place of inspiration or what kept you here? Um, what do you mean by first place of inspiration? Look, looking for stories to show the audiences, looking to garner audiences, things like this. Did you? That goes a long way back, way before okay. I arrived here. Um, basically, uh, my inspiration to become a filmmaker happened in three phases, kind of. I always loved movies and television and good stories and the awe of, and the power of the storytelling. Uh, that, that, you could say that that comes in my blood uh, because it runs in the family type of situation. Um, but at the same time, uh, when I was little, I wanted to be president of Mexico uh, because I've, I've had this ideal of changing the world, making everything better, and stuff like that. Um, despite that focus of mine, I happened to become a screenwriter for a TV show for kids when I was nine years old uh, because I was really into the environmentalist movement. I, mean, I still am, but back then I started a, a group in my school. Um, there was this network of schools that were running a, a green club, and that green club had a TV show every Saturday for kids, but they didn't have anybody to write these capsules for kids my age. And during an event, the director of that program approached me and asked, hey, would you like to start writing things for us? And I said, oh. Actually, they asked my mother if I could do that. And her response was, ask him, why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> you have a good mom. Yeah, no, she's awesome. She's awesome. Uh, also <laughs> crazy. Um, and so, um, so I got that experience and started doing that, but I, I was like that was part of kind of like getting my hand into influencing people and you know getting into politics sort of. Um, then the 2000 election happens and Vicente Fox gets the presidency, uh, and that was kind of like, oh, okay, if that jackass can get it, it's not a challenge. Uh, <laughs> what else can I do? Um, and I started toying with other ideas of how to inspire people or affect, you know, affect some change. Uh, and then I watch artificial intelligence uh, that I just, I watched it, I came out of the movie theater touched. Uh, I just wanted to, that was a decision point, the turning point of, I want to make movies and television that make others feel the way I'm feeling right now. And that mistake, I've respected it to the point that I haven't seen the movie ever since. Um, but that's when I started devoting myself to studying filmmaking books, asking my parents more about filmmaking, um, using the all the commentaries of the DVDs because those are awesome film schools when the commentary is actually good, um, and just focus on that. Later, I found out that it was the collaboration, the movie was the collaboration of Steven Spielberg, one of my favorites, one of my favorite movies that awed me was Jurassic Park, and Stanley Kubrick. Uh, so it made sense that the movie had touched me being the collaborative work of two of my favorites. Uh, but that's when I decided and just 
kept doing everything that drove me closer to my goal. Um, the um, directorial work in high school, um, wrote script, shot film, uh, short films with my friends during middle school and high school, um, worked in my local television as a scriptwriter and director of the kids show uh, during my gap year, worked in the uh, local theater as scriptwriter and assistant director, so the, every chance I had to learn and do things, uh, I took. And that's, that was the, the evolution and transformation. Is there a motif that your work touches on, or as a whole that your work touches on, that you always go back to when you're writing? Or? It's rock female characters. Oh. Um, it's it just come it just comes natural to me because I grew up surrounded by Amazons. Uh, well, no, seriously. Um, <laughs> grandmother, aunt's mother, all of them are strong female characters uh, in different senses of the word. Uh, to the point that kind of like if I had to mention one time that my reality bubble burst. You know, when you lose your innocence, was finding out that, oh my god, there are actually women who are doormats? Ah, oh, I can't believe that. Um, so yeah, that would be the one motif. Uh, I've actually kind of earned a reputation about that as a screenwriter, um, thanks to my friend Dan, who has a, a lot of connections. He's a really well-connected Mexican filmmaker that is funny that I say you, we're friends, but he has uh, being the mentee of Guillermo Arriaga, knows Jaime Camila, and if you're familiar with anything from Mexico, Latin America, basically he knows you or you know him. Um, so, and with work that we've done together, fixing scripts and uh, just working on projects, that has been my reputation of, oh, we found this thing. Uh, can you make the woman cooler? <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, I love it. Uh, However, in other, in other regards, I like all kinds of stories. Um, I have a particular fascination for film noir, um, but that, that doesn't mean that I only make film noir. As, as long as the story is good, uh, I'm gonna try my best to, you know, put a good message or tell it the way that it says it's best. Is there a particular message that you want to send through your work, or anything that you would like to have like, your magnet open, explain a certain message? Is there any message that you think is that significant? Um, to the point where this is what you want to center your greatest work around? Mm, other than the strong female characters, uh, not really. I. It depends on what what topic or theme comes into my attention and also it's a very collaborative approach that I like to have. Um, usually I have some kind of writing collaborator um, either with a producer or a co-writer um, because I work in terms of writing uh, stories I work better when I have limits or some kind of um, the starting point that comes not from me. Um, that's why uh, I'm really good at editing scripts and stories and stuff like that because I can I can work better when it's not my own work and then I kind of turn in mind but respect the others and things like that. Uh, but when I was working at the TV station back in Mexico, um, the showrunners uh, would tell me, oh, what, what are we gonna do this Saturday? Oh, just write something awesome. I'm like, no, no, give me one word. One word, tell me that you want cowboys, tell me that you want a superhero, because if you just give me like free reign, I'm gonna start putting like drug addicts and hookers in a kitchen. <laughs> like, you don't wanna go there with me. Um, so it's uh, it, it's just a matter of, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by the human carnival. So it, depending on what's the appropriate theme for the story, um, then I just explore that. Um, Message-wise, I don't have one particular message. Uh, I do prefer, though, uh, 
hopeful ending. Not necessarily happy, but I don't want people who watch my movies or television or read my stories to be like, oh my god, this is life, I can kill myself right now. Like, I, I really, I really don't like that sort of story. Like, I can, I can have all the characters killed in the end, but it was worth it. Uh, I don't want it to be like, oh, not, nothing, it's meaningless. That nihilistic approach, I, I just can't stand. Do you like any films that have that, those sort of endings, or are you more or less averse to films that have that sort of nihilistic ending? I can respect a movie that has a type of nihilistic ending, but I cannot come to like it. And I'm, I have a very marked distinction between liking a movie and respecting a filmmaker or or the movie like, oh, this was well made, I hate it, but it's really well made. Uh, anything that comes from uh, Alejandro González Iñárritu, I really dislike, because there is no way you can go into one of his films and come out with a smile or hoping to wake up tomorrow. Um, but, yeah. In your adventures, uh, in portraying these strong female characters that may or may not be hookers and things like this. <laughs> have you ever had anyone, any critics, that have been severe towards you for social critiques or portraying strong female characters in terms of social critiques? Uh, what do you think? Um, in my experience, I haven't found that um, yet. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see with the movie that they're shooting in February what, what happens. <laughs> maybe, maybe we have a, a bit of a preview or is that okay? Yeah, um, just in the story is uh, a rom com that is not a rom com, it's more of a family movie. Uh, but in, in the terms of kind of like um, Little Miss Sunshine, that you have the family, the family is the center of the interactions and everything, and you're supposed to have a hero with a love interest. Uh, but that's not, like, they don't even get to kiss during the movie. Uh, and why the social critique is yeah. um, Because we, in the film itself, we're gonna talk a lot of fun, for example, at uh, religious extremism, in, in a sense, and just kind of like logical lapses that can happen uh, when you believe something way too much and stop, stop listening to what you're saying uh, just because that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, because I was curious of your views of other artists such as Ai Weiwei and how he pokes fun in terms of critical culture and things like this. What are your views on other artists, including yourself, and how much they intermingle with critical forces and things like this? How much trouble are you envisioning in your, in your future? Um, I'll put it like this. Uh, one of my goals is to uh, be denounced by Fox News. Uh, <laughs> Sounds really fun. <laughs> it's not easy. Not yeah. very hard. <laughs> not very hard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Say something sensible, you will have. Exactly. Uh, also, people please it. Uh, no, and, and speaking of Hollywood, for example, you really get blacklisted if you work, if you ever have an association with Fox News. Fox, 20th Century Fox, that's totally fine. Um, but through my experiences in internships with NPR and Sony Television and like physically being work, you know, working in Los Angeles and stuff, it, it was just remarkable how there's this split and actually the, the Fox News headquarters in Los Angeles is a big black box. Out of, it's, it looks like uh, one of the destroyers of Star Wars, but in building form. <laughs> and it, it's odd for Los Angeles to have something like that because you're driving, you go past CVS that is all this nicey uh, stuff by the road, and then you just see like, what's that? Is that a prison? No, that's Fox News. Like, okay. <laughs> but, but if you said it's, it's business, you may be very cozy with Fox News, but you will bring in a hundred million dollars with every movie, a few hundred million dollars. 
No, I wouldn't know because Hollywood loves you. No, no. In, in the thing is that yes, they're very business oriented, but Fox News is one of those that you get the blacklist. Like you will start working only with people who have associated themselves with Fox News. Mm -hmm. uh, when you went to places in Los Angeles, when you go and you can see the little click of unknown that oh they work for Fox News, right? It's that type of segregation. Um, but going back to the politics of it all, um, I prefer to make them laugh when doing social critique than just, um, I like to wrap it up in something else, especially comedy or sci-fi or fantasy. That's why you have those genres to talk about things that you're not supposed to say out loud because then you get burned at the stake. Um, but people will still get it. There's still the message. And ultimately, you want to transmit that message not to those who have already their beliefs, you know, turned into rock, but those who are still forming them, uh, so that the others will pass on. And then, what remains is a new generation that loves Harry Potter instead of whatever it else was before. Um, so that's my approach about all of that. To yes, be political, but not necessarily. I mean, I love politics and all of that, but. Movies don't necessarily need to be political. Exactly. I prefer to entertain and then have a depth to it. But I want to give the audience the, the option of, oh, you want to go to the movie theater and enjoy a good story and just turn your brain off for a little bit, just a little bit, go ahead. Oh, you want to find deeper meaning into this movie? You can do that as well. I, I don't go for the Michael Bay <laughs> of just explosions and nothing else. Um, or the Tom Clancy of political allegory and things like that. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So, I think that a lot of people that are interested in cinema as, as a career are what we might call artistic types. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly that, that, that describes you, but you're also incredibly entrepreneurial. Um, you're not just being hired as a director or scriptwriter. You're, you're you're creating businesses. You help to to found UTV TV. Can you talk a little bit about how you have meshed these two often very very um, polarizing aspects of yourself, the artistic and and the business. I would uh, and following up on that, what are opportunities that cities outside of Hollywood, outside of LA, like Dallas, can bring to someone who can um, mesh those two. So the impression I get of Los Angeles is that you are either on the artistic side or you are on the commercial side and that there is a real tension that exists between those two. Okay, first addressing the, the tension part. Um, there is, but at the same time there isn't. Um, right now it has gotten a little bit more polarized because of how the business has started to work in the last 20 years. Before, um, the suits, the executives and the, the movie studios who would okay and manage the funding and the marketing and all of that, um, tended to come from or at least respect the creative side of things and not interfere too much. Now with foreign markets, marketing research, the internet, information, data, 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 um, there has been a switch, for example, that most of the presidents of studios and uh, <coughs> and of film divisions, television divisions, uh, have come from the marketing ranks, and they used to come from the producer ranks. The producers are the ones who uh, handle the money, basically run the business side of a movie or television series, but they, they know or respect about the creative side of it, the, the artistic side. Uh, and they would just go into the studio seat. Uh, now it has been the marketing, the one who came up with, oh, let's make Transformers. And because in China, they want the explosion cars and actually not, not that many women, um, focus on that. Even if we flunk in the States with one weekend in China, we make up for the entire movie. Um, and that has been the switching model now. Um, in regarding the cities, um, Los Angeles is really a hub that people, it's really funny because the people who actually run Los Angeles don't really live in Los Angeles. No one who actually has made it into the film industry lives in Los Angeles uh, for real. 
they actually live somewhere else and they have a house or an apartment in Los Angeles, go there whenever they need to and when they actually want to have seasons in their life, they go somewhere else. Uh, one of the prime examples is Matt McConaughey. Uh, he has an apartment here in downtown Dallas, or at least used to have one. He has his house near Austin uh, and he has a house in uh, Beverly Hills. Uh, but most of the time he spends here in Texas because all right, all right, all right. <laughs> uh, those who actually live in Los Angeles are all the people who want to make it and are trying to get a break or the, or the very exploited uh, crew members such as uh, her directors, direct assistants, all the, all the grunt work, all the grunt workers are the ones who live there in their twenty uh, in their thousand dollar apartment that is just not even half of this room. Uh, and yeah, it, it was eye opening for me when I went to Los Angeles uh, to find out that yes, the city the city gives you this energy, and as a filmmaker, it's mecca and all of that. But living there, um, I spent. Uh, a summer working uh, in Sony Pictures International uh, Television and in my time there it was like oh this is awesome but I don't want to live here like it, it's great to come work and Hollywood will do that they will go and get the talent somewhere else uh, and just bring it over use it and set you free uh, and that's that's what I wanted to do uh, because it's a uh, it's a very toxic environment, I would even dare to say, uh, over there. When you are part of the industry, then everything is a pitch, everybody's trying to make it. Uh, yes, you, you can get your circle of friends and start doing stuff, but the competition and uh, it's, I mean, every, all productions, all professional productions are full in Los Angeles because it's almost now impossible to actually make a movie there. Uh, the movie that you can shoot here in Dallas for under $3 million, it will balloon in Los Angeles to $12 million, just because all the regulations, rates, things that you have to cover as a production, because it's California, it's Los Angeles, there are all these rules that you have to follow, and if anywhere else, you can just opt out. Uh, and, and get the movie made for a lot less money uh, and just as much of the quality. Uh, and how I managed to balance the entrepreneurial side, well, I really like doing the, all of that. I like knowing how things are done so that then I can delegate and actually have the moral high ground of, yes, I know what you're supposed to be doing, do it right. Uh, I also like to not only do artistic stuff, but anything that has some kind of creation, creativity, uh, work satisfies my my needs, my drive. Uh, so working on setting up UTV TV was, was as much fun as actually shooting things for UTV TV. Give yeah. some details on that. I mean, a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of students try to like find their place on campus or to make their mark. Um, you helped to find UTV TV. How did you start doing that? How did you begin doing that? Who did you have to bring in? Um, how did you learn how to create something new on campus? Um, well, that came about uh, when Jacob and I met um, during one of the, well, during finals weekend and then one of the orientations and we became roommates and all of that. But from the beginning was like our plan to start UTV TV because he had done high school television and I had come from real television back in Mexico um, and EMAC was about to start, ATEC was it's still not so much centered on animation, it was a little more, uh, it was still finding its footing in what it was supposed to be um, and other colleges had TV stations even if it was just for inside their, uh, their campus and it was starting uh, we came when youtube and everything else was booming in terms of oh web content woo -hoo! Uh, and back then i don't know if, uh, 
that's still a thing, uh, we have to pitch something for our, um, what's the name of the class? The freshman experience year? Red 11. Yeah, Red 1101. Um, mm -hmm. We have to pitch something for the alumni fund, uh, something fun or interesting or worthwhile for the university. So we wrote the proposal, got the funding from the alumni fund, and then we started pitching to the appropriate people. Uh, the student media the, back then was not yet solidified, um, because actually one of the one of the reasons it was not solidified is because it was missing a piece like television. It was radio on one side, then you had print that were they were kind of in competition, AMP and the Mercury and. Uh, so when we pitch UPTV, that's when it's like, oh, then we can bring everything under an umbrella and kind of like organize things. Uh, because part of the pitch for us was we can start with news because they're really easy to produce and to have an actual content that people will click uh, and then expand to fiction and storytelling and things, uh, short films and fun things that then people will want to see. Uh, and it, it, it was a process that took us basically two years to get it set up. It was one year of pitching meetings, uh, getting people interested, gathering a skeleton crew uh, to get it started. And then we launched in late, to the, well, we started filming in late 2008 and actually launched big in early 2009. Um, and it was just a matter of keeping it alive the first couple of years. You know, trying to find where to find the spot, go to the provost and ask uh, for his blessing to, okay, please give us a place to film. Um, and, and now they have a budget, which I'm so proud of. <laughs> um, and that's basically, that whole experience trained Jake and I really well in, uh, that's how it goes. Every single time it's, every single time you have a project, you actually set up formally a different business, uh, a different LLC. That's a standard practice, that every single production is a little company of its own that is partially owned by whoever is making it and whoever's funding it. Uh, and it's this juggling of going to talk to investors, getting things done, getting things on time, selling it to markets, knowing what a market is, knowing how the film festival circuit works, distribution, what are the channels, what are the um, outlets, revenues, this, uh, uh, there's this whole business speak that goes along with it uh, that honestly a lot of people are, uh, people outside of Los Angeles may not be aware that it even exists. Um, because for example, all of that I learned through the film festival and by a summer class that I took at UCLA about production, uh, about independent produce, you know, independent producing. Um, uh, there was no way we would find here, not in SMU, not in UNT, not here. Uh, NYU and uh, other film schools kind of neglect that part as well. Uh, that they go for the, oh, this is the artistic, this is how you shoot, this is how you become a DP, this is how you become a director, screenwriting, great. Then what do you do with it? <laughs> or how do you convince someone that after you graduated, there are two routes. You can convince someone that you're great and that they can fund your movie, or then you start being at someone's assistant. Five years later, you might get a shot at scaling somewhere else, and you know, like you can take the ten-year route where you pay your dues and become someone's assistant and get connections, and then eventually get into a real project, and then eventually get your project of your own, uh, or you can actually learn how business works in general, how entertainment show business works specifically and then just crash into the door uh, which is kind of what i've been doing for uh, these past few years apart from i guess inventing to start new tv tv um what do you think attending college offers you like the primary takeaway do you think that you can learn a lot of these things on your own like because you study books and like written pieces on film production and things like that. Do you think you can do that independently in school maybe? Or what does UTV offer? Uh, UTV offers uh, 
Yeah, but the main thing I was going to say is TV. I cannot, that's the number one. Uh, number two, just learning in general. Um, I came out of here with a uh, degree in creative writing with minors in political science and philosophy. Um, and it's, uh, so it's very, what you can learn, uh, I'm also like that, but in terms of uh, the college experience helps with just your learning habits and socializing and being a, you know, growing into a real person. Uh, it also allowed, afforded me uh, coming here to the States and to just getting brain in the booming Dallas film community um, as part of the film festival and every single art event that giving the, the hands on. Um, and from, oh, also teaching wise, um, Dr. McLean uh, influenced me a lot. And the biggest thing was that taking her class about uh, Hitchcock convinced me that Hitchcock is actually someone to uh, aspire to and learn from. Before that, uh, I had a very, oh my god, he made so many movies, but repeats himself a lot, and I had a different perspective. But taking the class, I learned about all the background about how he made his movies, the collaboration, the creative process, the business side of things. He was the first director to ever brand himself and control his movies for the sake of profits and to, in order to be able to keep making his movies. Um, so that was eye-opening. Uh, so it's uh, it's a lot of learning. The the filmmaking process itself, you will always be learning because everything is changing in the industry. Uh, a new camera pops up, a new film festival happens, YouTube, Netflix, disruption here and there. Um, so it's every ten years, it's a different it's a different feeling for Hollywood and the film industry. Um, right now, it's it's all about television. Right now, the king is television. Film, anybody can make a movie. Not everybody is pressed into television. Television has been harder, but it has also become easier if you have, for example, content on the web. Because you can basically make your own television online and get your followers and get your sponsors and your setup. Um, yeah, so, you're always going to be learning. Yeah, you can answer your question. Um, I guess I was wondering about what, so the, the process of learning is what you can do on TV? Mm -hmm. Do you think that you're able to do something akin to that in a different way and still be successful? Probably, but not, not as fast. Um, because it helps a lot with, it, it's a platform. It gives you a platform from which to, to jump. Um, a lot of directors have been college dropouts and stuff like that. Uh, because depending on what school you go to, there might really be a difference between, oh, can I, should I pay, like, literally my last movie was uh, I made for cheaper than a year of NYU. Uh, so it's one of those that... Um, do you know Alejandro Menada, the Spanish filmmaker? Uh, he became famous in Spain because he dropped out of college in his last year, uh, grabbed his tuition money, shot his first film that he called Pieces, and he won the <laughs> Spanish Oscar for it and, uh, and became you know, one of the most successful filmmakers in his time when he was 25. Uh, and it's one of those that, it's not, it's not the whole like billionaire, oh, you can drop out and that's the way to be successful. It's not, no, each, each has their route. Um, and it's all about circumstance and how you, uh, how you manage. Because the knowledge is there, but you have to go and do it but you don't always have the means to do it or the motivation. Um, by that I mean that, for example, taking a class in film editing might force you to actually learn film editing because you can go and learn about it on a book, but 
when you actually sit down and do it, it's way different than anything that you could read. At the same time, there are times that you need to read and learn from what is already established as a standard in order to actually make it. That one is most obvious uh, as a screenwriter. Uh, that there are these very specific formulaic things that you have to cover in the script. There are these very specific industry standard uh, steps to follow that if you miss one of those, you immediately get discarded out of the stack of uh, reading uh, for the production company or for the agent or things like that. Like it's it's good to. It's good to learn independently because you're going to be doing that the rest of your life um, and the rest of your career. But having somewhere that kind of gives you some kind of a structure and platform to start from is, is from my perspective, the way to go. Uh, but, but probably not rely, not trust that school is going to teach you everything because it's not going to. Regardless, it doesn't matter what school you go to. Uh, you will not learn everything. You will you will learn how to learn and get your mentors and connect people. And I met my business, both of my business partners, Jake Wurzer and Elizabeth Stewart. Uh, we are the ones who are working now in the production company, and I met both of them in UTV. One was my roommate and everything. The other was just one of my classmates in a government class, and. We were the only two liberals among a plethora of Republicans in that class, so we became buddy buddy. Uh, and afterwards, it came that, oh, I love film, I would like to get into that. Uh, three years later, she finally joined the production company. Uh, so it's, there is no surefire formula, um, but there, there are steps that you can take in order to prepare yourself for how it's going to go. You mentioned um, industry industry standards. Do you mean in terms of plot, or like the way that you format like the screenplays? I mean everything. Really? Everything. Even the plot, like the story. Like do you have an example? Um, how familiar? Give me one of the one genre that you like, and I will give you the industry standard. That if you're liking one, they will tell you that you're rookie. Drama. That's that one doesn't count because it's not a real genre. It's a ghost stories. Ghost stories. Um, number one, you need the ghost, but you need the backstory of the ghost, what they're looking for, uh, and the haunting place. You cannot. It's weird to have a ghost that is everywhere. Uh, that's more of a demon in industry in industry terms. Uh, so for example, Ghost, the movie, <coughs> works and it uh, covers the plot because it's about the relationship and that's the attachment, her. He's haunting her, basically. Um, if he was just wandering the world as a ghost, shut down. It's, you're not giving me what I'm supposed to have. Industry standard, you will always need a, a, romantic, uh, a romantic interest. Even if that's not the... Uh, the standard of uh, even if that's not the point of the movie, you will always need a romantic interest. Even if nothing happens, but just a Latin thing. It's the it's the mandatory B story. There's A story, B story, C story. Uh, in television, uh, there's this structure of you have to have the cold open, and then you have Act One in which this and this happens, and you close the uh, the middle of uh, the episode with step number four that basically turns the, the whole story from being about choose to being about uh, marriage and it just those are the kind of things also uh, the format of the page that you have to have this log line and this and have it not necessarily in the exact space but if you go for let's say if you can in a movie, a screenplay that reads like a, a libretto, that's a no-no. Uh, so everything has a standard, and the way you speak, even uh, there's this thing that they call the speaking executive uh, that I learned in uh, 
Smithsonian with the film festival when we talk about what are we using like market, retribution, deals, stuff like that. We just speak that if you come out as, oh, I'm the artist filmmaker, blah, blah, blah. You go to a producer or a distributor and they tell you, oh, I wonder, uh, I wonder movie is going to have a limited distribution in 11, in, 11 in 11 domestic markets with a window of four months later for uh, online uh, while we go to foreign markets, specifically uh, the soft ones in Europe and the hard ones in Asia. Did you understand the, the word that I said? Well, that's local distribution until it goes online and then overseas. Yeah, exactly that. But it, it was all in, everything had a very specific mm -hmm. uh, meaning in terms of the distribution and the channels and how you're going to get your money back for the movie. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a weird contradiction in no, in no aspects of the film industry because it's very relaxed, but at the same time it's very formal or very, I don't want to say rigid because it's not the right word, but you can't, you need to prove that you know the rules before you are allowed to break them. Um, I was about to say for an artist that's looking for outlets that may be outside of those uh, regulations and standards. Um, where do you find yourself trying to push those boundaries? How may one look for a market that will help you push those boundaries? My suggestion for someone who is completely an artist type and wants to do that, you find a producer who you can trust with your life and that becomes your producer forever. Um, that's that's a step that all the greats have followed. Um, Steven Spielberg has um, I'm blanking on her name Kennedy. Uh, I can't remember her first name, but she has been his producer since he was making TV movies. Um, Hitchcock had his wife. Uh, that's how they met. She hired him. Three movies later, he finally has the balls to ask her out, uh, <laughs> and then they get married, and they make all the great movies uh, that Hitchcock made. Uh, same thing goes for Stanley Kubrick. Uh, same thing goes for uh, Chris Nolan, Christopher Nolan, Woody Allen. For, Woody Allen. Uh, for an amazing amount of time, every year. And he'd come out with a film, and his producer was the same person for three years. Yeah. Um, Martin Scorsese, um, he actually changes producers like every 10 years, but he has always used the same editor, for example, so that Tom Schumacher, uh, who knows exactly what he's envisioning. Um, so, if you're the super artistic type, you need to find a business minded producer that will protect you and help you get your movies made and they will figure out everything else. They will find the market that is out there for your working ex, if you're Tim Burton or if you are uh, Terry Gilliam, like, they will fix it. Uh, you just need to be able to talk to them. Like, they need to understand you and you need to trust them. And with that dynamic, then anything is possible. Minutes left in our, our, our round table. Um, what's the next uh, two years going to bring for you? What are some of the goals that you set for yourself in terms of projects you will bring to completion and projects that you would like to commit? Um, in that regard, I hope to finish uh, a biopic about Eamon Carter that I've been working on for the past year and a half that it's finally getting some proper traction and one of my goals would be to have a, a festival run with it and hopefully uh, maybe even at least one Oscar nod or Golden Globe nod uh, because part of the plan with that movie is to have an original song which is one of the easiest categories to sneak a movie into. <laughs> you literally need a, a, only a hundred votes from Academy members and there are 5,000 members that you can ask. So, uh, See, those are industry things that 
you don't know until you're in. Mm. Um, and we'll see what else. That's that's the one that I can actually see where it's going. Everything else, I just have six or seven projects at a time um, on the stove, and whichever starts overflowing first um, get the attention. You also do your work uh, curating collecting films for the the film festival. Well, they tell me that they don't want me anymore, but actually. Um, and this is kind of on the down low. There's a possibility that uh, we will resurrect a uh, Latino festival here in Dallas, mm -hmm. and I will be in charge of that effort. So we're still. Could be a good thing for the Asian, the Dallas Asian Film Festival to always be successful. Why not? Yeah, no, and I mean, it's literally resurrecting. It's one that used to be here in Dallas that just kind of disappeared seven years ago, exactly. Uh, um, Dallas has this now very um, cyclical uh, film festival circuit that we're all friends, we're all connected, but each has there's the Asian Film Festival, the Black Film Festival, uh, the Video Fest, um, what other one? Now the military one, the new one. Uh, there's there's Oakland. Um, so then there used to be the Latino one, but it just fell apart. And we're trying to bring it back because that's the one thing that we're missing. <laughs> so yeah, that was the other one. Any final questions? I have an interesting one for you. Every student that's ever been has had their mentors telling them to ask the right question. When was the like the one epitome moment that someone told you ask the right questions? enabled you to proceed with all of your future events. Just like the one moment that you felt was most crucial. Mm, probably, um, I mean, there are several, but probably the one that I can pinpoint in, in that tone of uh, what's the most, like asking the right questions, uh, was my interview when I, after I applied uh, for an internship at uh, uh, AFI Dallas, the Film Society, because I went uh, to the headquarters that was back then in Victory Park, and I was supposed to interview for an assistant job to the CEO and main director, Michael Kane. Uh, that was the idea. However, on the way there, I got an email from Sarah t telling me, no, you're going to interview with James and me. Um, with, with programming, um, we'll talk. I show up, and um, when I walk in, they basically ask me, like, do you like this? Do you want to work for us? Uh, because they had just loved my uh, cover letter and the fact that, like, that I spoke five languages, that I could help them out with the international section, that I knew what I was, that I already knew about film festivals and stuff like that. I wanted just to watch movies, criticize them, and, uh, you know, pick what we curate, um, the selection, but not just on, oh, I want these movies, but from the beginning, it was a, uh, how we need to pick movies that are good, but also that work well together. Um, and luckily, the three of us understand each other very well. Uh, James and I have the exact same taste in movies to the point that we will react with the same things while when we are watching a movie. Uh, we will curse at the character or say like, that cut was wrong, what's wrong with the director at the same time? It's kind of funny. Um, so that, that works well and then with Sarah who uh, does short and uh, documentaries, we all understand each other like, oh, if you like this one, soup a lot, then I'm not going to like it that much because those are the different sensibilities, but I know that this one you should watch and stuff like that. So we get to make a very dynamic uh, selection that where we know that we're hitting different audiences. That, oh, this is great for a final film, this is great for a comedy, we can bring this uh, specific group as partner for this other screening, like, 
Well, this is about public international politics, like for the World Council, the World Affairs Council, and things like that. So that would be the one moment when I met them and that we just clicked. Uh, that because after that, yes, I was an intern in title, but never in practice. And sometimes, and even after the second year, the intern part went away, and I became an associate. Um, the, and that title has changed in in name, but not in in function. That when the festival happens, I'm one of the people that can make decisions on the spot, and nobody can question my authority, with whatever authority that may be. Um, and again, that that's one of the main reasons that I got to make a lot of connections here because I, I'm part of the staff running the film festival here that is an effort of everybody who's someone in the film industry. So that would be there. Well, that's a good perspective. Walking to an interview and, and talking with the people who are going to be your future colleagues, if, for your, if your situation was absolutely critical to find the right mindset. <laughs> that was, that's a good perspective. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Yep. Thanks for coming, guys.